Hey, hello, Rick Kikata here. You're probably wondering what the heck's going on. Well, I might have mentioned to you that when we recorded the LA course, the uh, EMA course for 2013, we screwed up on a lecture. Well, we did, and I recorded the wrong lecture before. So this is the right one. This is uh, entitled "Lady Crowding Causes, Consequences, and Fixes. It was written by Peter Vicelio, who is acknowledged to be one of the uh, experts on this topic. Um, it's got 25 abstracts in it, and it's really written for two people, you, so that you kind of get a sense of what the literature says on this. But frankly, to be more, more importantly, I'm interested in your CEO and your COOs understanding that having people cr uh, held up in the emergency department because they're crowded or holding patients who are admitted is costing your hospital substantial money. But more importantly, there are substantial health consequences, including death associated with ER delays. So this is the literature that supports that. If they are interested in fixing the problem, this should be a driver uh, for it. Um, I must admit that my point of view on this is that I don't understand why CEOs and uh, COOs don't fix this problem. Like, you know, we have cell phones. It's kind of miraculous. We got MRI machines and CT machines, and a bunch of years ago we put somebody on the moon and yet we cannot uncrowd these emergency departments? Is this an insolvable problem? Well, of course it's solvable. And frankly, I'm really glad that the Joint Commission finally did something useful in the emergency department other than looking at your um, uh, procedure manuals and are starting to measure or ask you to report on measures of door to uh, provider time, throughput times, and some other essential kinds of times like uh, door to EKG and thrombolytic times and things like that. Um, because I think maybe that will wake up the CEOs to, hey, my bonus may be tied to this. And frankly, I think it ought to be. If in fact the CEO's bonuses were tied to ED throughput, this problem would be fixed tomorrow. Tomorrow, that's what I believe. I just don't think that they're willing to make the hard choices. And there are hard choices involved, but it seems pretty straightforward to me that this can be fixed. Anyway. Um, uh, you know, as an aside, there's, there's a lot of facts and figures in this, and I'm going to sprout them out. They may not be in any particular order uh, uh, or particularly consistent, but you, 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 they need to know that half the patients who are admitted to the hospital, you know, in that neighborhood, are admitted to the hospital. And that's how supposedly hospitals make money, is they admit patients to the hospital kind of thing. And um, so the ER now is kind of like the epicenter of hospital admissions. And when Obamacare comes along and you don't have to wait three days to transfer somebody to a nursing home who does, instead of admitting them to the hospital, then there's going to be patients directed to holding, there's going to be patients admitted, there's going to be patients sent to uh, outside facilities, and all of it is going to be focused on the, uh, what goes on in the emergency department. Um, first question, emergency department crowding, it's like pornography. I know it when I see it. Obviously, it's the inability to reasonably so, uh, provide uh, places to be seen for the next emergency department patients. No, no big secret here kind of thing. They have come up with some kind of measure, the NEDOX measure, which is the National ED Crowding Score, um, in an attempt to kind of compare apples and apples with regard to ED crowding. Um, what are the causes of crowding? Well, a lot of people think it's because we have a lot of unnecessary visits and people are going there who want to be going to primary doctor and the uninsured are going and we have uh, ER abusers that can't come, you know, three times a day. And the literature really has addressed all that. Uh, that. But the fact of the matter is, what are you going to do about it? You can't change any of that for, uh, realistically. Uh, there's EMTALA, which basically says you're going to see everybody and do a medical screening exam on them. There is the, uh, the fact that there are, uh, Obamacare is going to result in 33 million more people insured. Say, hot dog, I'm going to the ER because they can't go to primary care because there's not enough primary care. There's still going to be 25 million people who are not insured under uh, Obama. A lot of them are going to be uh, illegal uh, aliens or what is that, whatever the politically correct term uh, to use there. Um, there's going to be these fluxes of seasonal illnesses. When the flu seasons come on, they're not going to be able to be seen in the doctor's office. They're going to go to us for basically useless treatment. Um, and uh, there is this issue of frequent flyers. I don't like that term. I think it's a derogatory uh, term. I think that uh, there's something more appropriate we can call these people who come uh, uh, to our departments frequently. Um, 
it's not like they don't have significant medical conditions, and maybe a lot of them don't have doctors where they can go to be treated, or pain specialists who can kind of help them out kind of thing. But um, I, don't, I don't really kind of um, think we should kind of denigrate these folks. Yeah, some of them may be, um, you know, drug-seeking, things like that, but don't paint the brush uh, for all people who come back more frequently than you'd like to see them. Um, so there, there's some literature about are the uninsured uh, the cause of these problems? Well, first of all, before we get into it, you know, most emergency departments admit, you know, about 20% of the patients on average and send home 80. If you only had the admitted patients to deal with, you would, you would have to shut down your emergency department. The 80% of the people who go home are the bread and butter of the emergency department. They have the option of going to this hospital or that hospital or that urgent care center. So to the extent that you make their visits uh, pleasant, you'll get business from them. And, you know, the average charges in emergency rooms are ridiculous. You know, the physicians may get $100, $120 average collected per patient. What does the hospital get? Probably $600. So in an ER visit, it's like 700 bucks. It's ridiculous in terms of collected. So for every patient who goes home that uh, uh, inappropriately because they left without being seen or everyone who doesn't uh, want to be seen in your emergency room because you don't value their time, somebody else is going to get that money or an urgent care center is going to get that money. So the uninsured, are they the problem? Uh, look at this paper number one. It's an extensive literature review, 201 references, 201 references um, they looked at the results of 127 studies, and basically they concluded, yeah, the uninsured have lack of access to primary care, no secret there. Number two, it's more expensive to see these folks in the emergency department than an office visit, no argument there. Uh, number three, the uninsured basically delay seeking care, and therefore when they do seek care, they are sicker, and, uh, and in general they receive less care than everybody else. But, 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 is that the problem in the emergency department? They conclude, 127 references, current data do not support the assumptions that the uninsured use the ED more frequently than the insured for non-urgent conditions or for convenience, or that the uninsured are the leading cause of ED crowding. That's the conclusion of 127 studies. Um, number two, the effect of low complexity patients on emergency department waiting times. What did this paper conclude? Well, it's from the University of Toronto. They looked at 4 million ED visits seen in 110 of their EDs up there in the, uh, up the north. And um, what they conclude, efforts to reduce the number of low complexity ED visits are unlikely to decrease ED crowding or waiting times in any meaningful way when you go through their data and their analysis. Um, one of the things that Pe uh, Peter talks about is, uh, what, is uh, what does it mean when you say your, your unit is full? Well, in the ICU, it means you have uh, two patients for every one nurse. On the floor, it may mean you have one patient for every four on the monitored unit or one patient for every six on the other units. That's what it means. Uh, in the ER, it, it means you can have as many patients as you can possibly handle and still more. The unwashed masses are out there to be seen, and we have no limits. And uh, that's just the nature of emergency medicine. But sometimes some of the nurses say, well, I'm sorry, I can't see any more patients, so let them sit out there and wait. They're just as sick out there as they are in the emergency department. So you have to kind of have some capabilities to deal with them. And most ERs have very poor, poor um, ability to flex with a volume. You know, McDonald's has the ability. They have more people at dinner and lunch than they have at, uh, in, the, in the middle of dinner and lunch. Kind of, how do they do that? And they're charging $4 for a hamburger, and you're charging $700 for an ER visit, for crying out loud. All right, what are the consequences of crowding? So here's the literature on the medical consequences of crowding. Hopefully the CEOs and you will both be concerned. They are very rare, real and surprisingly serious. Anyway, paper number three, U.S. Emergency Department Performance on Wait Time and Length of Visits. This is... Um, the Institute of Medicine, here's what they had to say. ED crowding in the United States is a national epidemic. You know, I don't get it. I don't get it. These are people bringing $700 a visit, and we just can't, we don't, we are not just able to see, to see them for some reason. We can't do it. Um, they basically include uh, only 31% of the EDs achieve target triage times for more than 90% of their patients, which means that a a lot, if not most, EDs are screwed up in terms of their ability to see patients. Um, when they looked at their throughput times, 
There was a threefold difference between the slowest and fastest quartiles in the median wait time of patients who should have been seen within 15 minutes of presentation. There's a bunch of papers in this chapter that uh, are referenced, but are, we don't have the abstracts in them. And because Peter's just got such a fond, font of knowledge, or fund of knowledge, either one, regarding this topic, he's stuck in a lot of papers that we didn't have. Um, a lot of these papers are by Jesse Pines, University of Pennsylvania, who has a substantial interest in the consequences of ED crowding. Um, one of the biggest uh, causes of ED crowding is boarding. We know that. It's the ability to get patients promptly out of the emergency department after a mid decision is made. One of the things that has been shown about boarding is that it increases total hospital length of stay. You wouldn't think that holding somebody in the ER for four or six hours would have anything to do with their total license of stay. I got five papers that basically say that boarding people in the emergency department, generally defined as over six hours, adds one day to the length of stay in the emergency department. One day. No, uh, no, no. One day to the length of stay in the hospital. And obviously, if you're a Medicare patient, you're not going to pay for that day. And if you're a case rate patient, you're not going to pay for that day. So you're just going to eat it. And the other thing that happens when you hold patients in the emergency department is that nurses have to do all this additional work, give medicines, do vitals, write notes, all this other stuff, and we get no credit for it. You can't raise the ER bill because you're holding a patient for six hours. So, um, and one of the things about that is um, I really think it's important for you to measure how long you are holding patients so that you can show to the vice president of nursing and say, listen, we held, we held your patients, these inpatients, for all this time, and we get absolutely no credit for it in terms of our staffing. Uh, thank you very much. At least give us a pizza. Um, let's see here, let's see here. You know, this is, the Australians did a lot of stuff on this thing called access block. Uh, they, that's when somebody stayed in the emergency department six hours or more access block. That terminology you ought to get familiar with because Australians are writing a fair number of papers uh, on this. Um, boarding also increases walkouts. You know, the, na the national average, I think, for walkouts is about 3% which means one out of 33 patients, they get so disgusted with us that they leave um, and taking their $700 with them uh, and going down to the urgent care center. It would be happy to see them down the street. Um, now here are the papers that talk about overcrowding, reducing the quality of care and increasing medical errors. Um, according to the Joint Commission, 50% of sentinel events occur in the ED, great, and approximately a third of these are related to overcrowding. Um, Multiple studies document inferior care rendered during times of crowding. You know it, I know it. Abstract number five um, documents the impact of crowding on care of asthma or long bone fractures in uh, children. Number six shows a similar association between crowding and delays to provision of analgesics for patients with abdominal pain. Number seven is uh, also uh, indicating a um, problem with pain management uh, as a result of crowding. And then there are four papers by Jesse Pines, 8, 9, 10, and 11. Eight, ED crowding is associated with poor care for patients with severe pain. That's a recurring theme. The uh, association between emergency department crowding and adverse cardiovascular outcomes in patients with chest pain, we'll get to that paper more specifically, but they have a lot of worse outcomes when we hang around the emergency department. And then there's two, 10 and 11, both talk about Time to antibiotics for patients with community-acquired pneumonia being screwed up when we have uh, crowding in the emergency department. Um, not in the abstracts, a review of 162 boarded admissions noted a total of 43 medical errors, four regarding upgrades. They should have been going to ICU or uh, monitor bed. Two poorly controlled BPs, one hypoxic event, nine missed medications, 31 missed home medications, four missed lab tests, and two arrhythmias during the period of boarding. Um, <laughs> we're even seeing chest pain patients now in the emergency department, a waiting room, and we think it's okay. Uh, this is my favorite, number 12. Safety of assessment of patients with potential ischemic chest pain in an emergency department waiting room, a prospective comparative cohort study. Uh, Art Kellerman writes, waiting room medicine, has it really come to this? I think we should just move it to the parking lot. As they drive up in the car, why don't we just check them out right there and let them keep on driving? 
Uh, overcrowding causes deaths. Um, several recent articles conclude that the rate of death is higher during crowding in the ED. Um, the effect, the hazard ratio for death of approximately 1.3 is larger than the effects of other initiatives. This is kind of interesting. So if the deaths go up 1.3 hazard ratio, well, what, what's, and we, well, nobody pays really much attention to that kind of thing, but we're so kind of focused on uh, antibiotics within you know, four hours or blood cultures within 13 seconds or um, all of these other measures. What about death in the emergency department? Do you want to fix that at all? So what the point was, they're emphasizing these while you're ignoring the, the, the big guy, death. Um, as an example, compliance with four-hour antibiotics for pneumonia is estimated to reduce the number per 100 patients who would have died from 100 to 93. Okay, save seven. Overcrowding studies estimate that deaths would be reduced from 100 to a range between 75 and 83. A heck of a lot uh, more compared to giving those antibiotics in four hours. Um, Again, another paper, not in the abstracts, by Dr. Chalfin. An increased hospital length of stay, seven versus six days, and higher mortality, 10.7% versus 8.4% for ICU patients. Actually, this paper was in the abstracts, is in the abstracts, if you're a subscriber. This is a powerful, powerful paper. It's done by the uh, American Society for Critical Care Medicine, and they looked at a huge number of patients. It's a big deal to change your ICU mortality from 8.4% to 10.7%, 2%, 2 2.3% absolute increase in deaths because you're screwing around holding ICU patients in the ER. Um, Singer, also not in the abstract, found an increase in uh, mortality and increased length of stay as a function of how long the patients waited uh, in the ED. The mortality rate was 25 for those percent boarded for less than two hours, increasing the 4.5% for those boarded for greater than 12 hours. Similar length of stay increases 5.6 versus 8.7 days. So the length of stay went up as well. Again, this is a recurring theme. Um, what else you got? Oh, Richardson, 13. Um, increase in the patient mortality at 10 days associated with ED overcrowding, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, number 14, entitled The Association Between Hospital Overcrowding and Mortality Among Patients Admitted by a Western Australian Emergency Departments. Um, you know what this may mean is that if you're holding these patients forever in your emergency department, it may mean that the whole hospital is screwed up. Because if they can't take them onto the floor or onto the ICU, then maybe the, this is just kind of the canary in the mine regarding um, a much larger problem that, than just holding patients in the emergency department. Yes, we all acknowledge it's a hospital problem, not an ER problem if we can convince our administration of that. But I think that that's true. I think that if you can't get patients out, it means that everything is going to hell upstairs. All right, overcrowding causes ambulance diversions. Well, that's obvious, forget that. Um, uh, and lastly, overcrowding harms physicians. You bet it does. There was a personal communication from Jay Kaplan that uh, Peter wrote about. The frequency of malpractice suits filed against an emergency physician is increased by a factor of fivefold if a patient waits more than 30 minutes versus less. Obviously, that's kind of like a little um, manipulation of the data in that emergency department suits are really pretty, 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 pretty uncommon. So fivefold means fivefold of what? But anyway, it makes sense. That'll help make the case about why you ought to not bore these patients. What about the financial consequences? Well, it's obvious that if you can't get new patients in to be seen because you've got the beds tied up with patients you can't get out of there, that you're, there's this opportunity cost that which you're losing. So number 16 gets into that, the opportunity loss of boarding admitted patients in the emergency department by Dr. Falvo, Academic Emergency Medicine. This was at, done at York Hospital, one hospital, and they had a, their rule was two hours. From the time we would do it, admit decision, two hours, they got to get out of there. And for every hour thereafter, they looked at their inability to see other patients uh, as a result. And they concluded at Little Old York Hospital that the annual loss of revenue, it's hard to conceive of, was $4 million, with $3 million additionally due to admissions that you couldn't get, and $1 million due to outpatient visits. I think that that's, you know, when you look at their numbers, um, they say that an outpatient is worth $384. 
Well, that might be the case at York Hospital, but it's not the case here in Los Angeles. And that an admitted patient is worth $5,400. And I think that that's low as well. But even if they're wrong by 50%, even, your, if, it, even if it was instead of $4 million, $2 million, you think you can get the intention of the CEO when you said, hey, we're just walk, $2 million just uh, walked out the door? Um, 17, the financial burden of emergency department congestion and hospital crowding for chest pain patients. Uh, what did this one conclude? Um, let's see. Oh, the lost opportunity cost um, it was calculated at $168,000 or $204 for each patient who waited for more than three hours for a hospital bed. That's a different way to look at it. Um, Peter's Hospital, he said that uh, at the, uh, um, his institution estimated that an average reduction of length of stay by a quarter of a day a quarter of a day would yield $35 million to the benefit of State University of New York at Stony Brook. $35 million for a quarter of a day? Anyway, uh, how can uh, boarding of admitted patients in ED be reduced? Uh, there's bajillions of solutions within the ED. You know, it's this kind of the position in triage, um, you know, diverting patients who need minor care to the you know, the rapid section, so they're not in line with all of the more serious cases. You know, I don't know how I feel about all of these order sets in advance. I have certain reservations about them because I think they result in over-ordering uh, at the patients and insurance companies' expenses. You know, bedside registration, eh, that's a no-brainer. Scribes, you know, these ER, EMRs slope doctors down terribly, I believe. I mean, I don't know why the, what the hospitals think they're getting out of them. But, the lost opportunity cost associated with EMRs is really substantial. Um, so there's a bunch of things that you can do in the emergency department, but, but the real issue is getting patients out of the department who are being boarded upstairs. That's, that's really the issue. Um, sometimes we think that, well, if we get more ER beds, that will fix the problem. And there are two papers there, uh, 19 and 20, uh, adding more beds to the emergency department or reducing admitted patient boarding times, which has a more significant influence on emergency department congestion. And they clearly prove that adding more beds is this going to result in more holding. And that's the same conclusion as number 20, the effect of ED expansion in, on ED uh, overcrowding. ED expansion alone is insufficient to impact ED overcrowding as reflected by the length of stay or ambulance diversions in this study number 20. How about adding hospitalists? Yeah, hospitalists would be great if they're your friends and they're going to facilitate getting patients admitted and they're cruise, going to cruise around and see who can be moved out and call Dr. So-and-so, we're going to be discharging your patient, and that you have uh, a, a holding lounge for admitted patients, so they're out of there by 11 o'clock in the morning. You know, it's like all the hotels, you know. You're not going to wait till 6 o'clock for uh, mom and pop to pick up um, grandma kind of thing. Um, so hospitalists can, can be a, a great aid in this, but you know, there's a study there that says hospitalists are cool. That's number 2021, 20, but it wasn't just hospitalists. They, th in that study, they also had a bed czar who had the authority to move patients around. They had the ability to call in additional help when they needed it. Um, so it was really a package of things. They had a bunch of protocols that they followed that uh, facilitated getting patients in and out so um, adding a hospice is okay, but it's really better when it's a really a comprehensive program. Um, what else? Um, let's see here. Um, 22 time series analysis of variables associated with daily mean. Uh, 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 I don't know what that. Uh, we'll skip 22. 22 full capacity protocol. That's Peter's idea. This is the idea that when your emergency department reaches a certain threshold, you get the admitted patients up to the hallway of the floors where they're supposed to go. Obviously, the nurses hate this. At our hospital, our nurse manager said this, over my dead body. That was her uh, uh, response to Peter's protocol. However, Peter has done a, a bunch of studies on this already. Number 23, half of the patients admitted to the hallway got to a bed within an hour of arrival on the hallway. Miraculously, a bed was found. Miraculously, they got that room cleaned. You know, obviously, there's a lot of sabotage on the floors. They don't want new patients to change a shift. Somebody went to lunch, I, and there's nobody to take a report. There's whole kinds of bunch of things going on that inhibit the movement of patients to the floor. 
but Peter's Hospital did it, and they've done it for a long time now. Um, what about patient satisfaction? Yeah, patients love to wait long times to be seen and then be put in hallway beds and have no privacy, and yeah, they think it's great. Um, again, I think that uh, patient satisfaction in ER should be linked to the CEO's compensation. Now, what they can't do is just beat you up to do better and not change anything else. Yeah, that's, that's not fair. Um, let's see here. Oh, there's some studies about where patients would be preferred to be in, a, in the hallway, in the, uh, in the ER or uh, upstairs. And those that had a preference said, I'd rather be upstairs, obviously. Lastly, 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 I wanted to tell you about a paper that was um, pub, uh, presented to the SAEM meeting 2012 by Grant Innes. Um, he's the Canadian head of a whole province up there where they initiated uh, Peter's full capacity protocol. They noted substantial and sustained improvement in flow. This paper was entitled Policy Driven Improvements in Crowding System level changes introduced by a provincial health authority and its impact on emergency operations in 15 centers. Hopefully that'll get printed and you'll be able to look at that in its detail. Grant Inn is a really smart guy. I admire him a lot. Okay, there's a lot of stuff in this chapter. It can't really be done well in a half an hour, but I did do it as best I could. Um, but there's lots in fact, of facts and figures. It would be absolutely terrific if you could, you know, have the confidence of your CEO slash COO and talk to them about this. Um, there got to be some drivers, and they, 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 these are the folks who can fix it. This is not a bottom-up, well, the ER works to make this better. It's a top-down process. They need to want to do it, and they need to be motivated to do it. And again, don't tell me this is an insoluble problem. Can't believe it. Anyway, that's, uh, that's ED crowding causes, consequences, fixes. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.